Thank you guys for joining us. I really believe that support raising, though it's probably one of the most difficult things about being a missionary, I believe it is one of God's greatest tools for sending laborers into the harvest field. Because when you're able to build a solid support base financially, a team of supporters with you, you've got tremendous liberty to go where you feel like the Lord's telling you to go. You got people who'll stand with you in changes through ministry because they believe in you. They believe in what you're doing. And um, so it's, I believe it's one of God's greatest tools. The other thing is it, I think one of the greatest things about building a support team is it allows people who maybe wouldn't have other opportunities to be involved in things to get involved. For example, with me, there's ministries around the world that I would love to be a part of. I'd love to be a part of helping here or doing this or doing that. I can't do all those things, but by supporting those who are, Matthew actually tells us uh, that we share in the same reward. If you honor a prophet because he's a prophet, it says you receive a prophet's reward. If you honor a righteous man because he's a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. And I believe that you extend that on out. If you're honoring a missionary or someone who's raising children in an orphanage or caring, rescuing women out of sex trafficking or whatever it is you're doing, you're going to share in that reward. And so it's a way that I can be involved in ministries that I wouldn't be able to otherwise. So it's a tremendous privilege for me to be able to support other missionaries as, as I do. But I also then have people have an opportunity to be a part of my ministry because of their being on my support team. So I just believe it's part of God's economy, this support raising thing. Uh, because it gives us tremendous liberty to follow the Lord, but it also gives people an opportunity to be a part of what we're doing. So what we're going to talk about here is the idea of building a support team. How do you do that? How do you build a strong and a healthy support team? Let me start just by telling you our story. 30 years ago, I, was, I had been pioneering a new church and it was in Texas, and it was a time in Texas when we were struggling here. The oil prices had plummeted, and so there were a lot of unemployment, a lot of repossessed homes. It was just a really bad economic time, and uh, I was trying to pioneer a church, and we were out in kind of a rural area, so we were always struggling just to pay the bills, let alone pay a salary for the pastor. And um, it was at that time, uh, after about four years of that, that, that the Lord opened the door for us to go into the mission field. And we had felt like it was something God was calling us to. And so we had to raise our support to do that. And the agency I was going with, they had no training. They were a brand new agency. They really didn't tell you anything. And um, I was from a, a, a struggling financial church. And uh, so I talked to the elders and I said, you know, I really would like, I feel to, like talk to you today, comma. And, um, so I, once I resigned, they said, well, you know what? We want to support you for six months to help you get your support raised. So, oh, that's really, that's wonderful. And about six weeks later, they came back and they said, you know, we've kind of checked the finances and we're not really going to be able to do that six month commitment. So um, you got about another week. And so all of a sudden we're like, oh my gosh, um, I, I thought of a proverb. It says the worker's hunger drives him on. And <laughs> so all of a sudden, if I didn't do something, I was going to have three hungry kids and a hungry wife. We'll and, call too, you you know? when I'm done with this and so I knew we had to do something here. And um, so I didn't know how to raise support. All I knew to do was to contact a couple of pastor friends I knew to see if maybe I could come and share at the church. Thanks for your understanding. And exclamation to, mark. Um, also uh, send out a letter. So I put together a letter and uh, hand addressed it. There was no fancy word processor back there. To I got together about 200 names of people and hand addressed all these and mailed out a letter telling everybody we're going on the mission field and would you support us? And we waited after the letter went out and we waited and, and we waited and we waited. And a month went by and uh, we thought, wow, okay, maybe we need to send another letter. All those must have gotten lost in the mail, you know? And so we sent another letter. And just telling people what was going on. And we waited and we waited. And meantime, I'm calling a couple of pastors. And I knew one that, oh, man, he's going to let me share at his church. And he yeah, didn't. Right. And it just kind of uh, really blew me apart. You know, I didn't. I thought, man, my missions career is is uh, is crash dived before it's even started. So we sent that second letter. And a few weeks later, we got, we got one letter in. And it said, we're going to support you for $10. I got to tell you, that was the sweetest $10 I had ever heard of, you know. Wow, maybe this is going to work after all. <laughs> so the long and the short of it is we were able to get our support together in about six months and went on the field. It wasn't We weren't fully supported at that time, but we were able to make it. And over the time, 
I've been at this 30 years now, and I've learned some things that work and some things that don't work. And I've had the privilege of seeing the backside of missions, this side of it as a missions director, seeing what comes in for people. When they do this, see what kind of response they get. When they do this, what kind of response they get. And I've learned through a lot of my own pain, but I've learned through the pain of others as well. And so what I want to share with you guys, I want to try and save you some pain and help you to be able to learn from some of the mistakes I've made and mistakes I've seen other people make and help you learn how what gets traction, what works, and what may cause a lot of effort, but it doesn't work. It just doesn't get traction. It's like wheels spinning in the sand. So that's what this is all about. We want to just really help you to get fully funded. Let me just ask everybody, if you would, mute your microphones. Um, so yeah, I can a question at the end. You you'll see a little <laughs> microphone down in the left-hand corner there of your screen or somewhere. If you'll click on that, it'll it'll mute you, and that way we won't have all distractions popping in. All righty? So um, I believe that um, you can be fully funded. You can be funded to do what God's called you to do because this is his dream, and if it's his dream, he's going to provide the funds for it. It's just up to us to go out and find out where God has those funds because God stores his funds in the pockets of his people. And so we just need to connect with those people that God has called to be a part of the project that he's called us to be a part of because there are those out there. And so I believe we can all be adequately funded to do what we need to do. And adequately funded doesn't mean if you ask most missionaries, how much do you need? They go, well, just enough to get by. But the thing is, God has not called us to get by. He's called us to minister and ministry costs money. And so just kind of making it to the end of the month so that you have enough to have beans and rice in the in the cupboard the last day of the month, that's really not enough because you need to be able to minister liberally. And that's what God's called us to do is to be ministers, and that costs money. And so we need to maybe put our vision a little bit higher and um, realize that God's not short on funds. And if he's called us to do this ministry, he is going to fund it. He's going to provide for it. So. Where do we start? Well, as, as believers, we ought to start, is this biblical? Okay, is this, is this in the Bible? Is having a support team biblical? And uh, if you've got your notes, you might start filling in there. If you printed those out ahead of time. Um, mm -hmm. The first thing is this. Did you know that Jesus had a support team? It talks about it in Luke 8, 3. Amazing. Jesus had a support team. And if anybody didn't need a support team, the guy who could take five loaves and two fish and feed 4,000 or 5,000, he didn't need a support team. And yet he allowed people, and it talks about, it even lists some of the people that were on his support team. That's how important they were in kingdom thing, is that God listed them in the scriptures, Luke 8, 3. And so they actually invested in his ministry. So Jesus had a support team, people who gave financially to enable his ministry. And, uh, you know, Paul had a support team. We, we read about that. And uh, many times we think of Paul as being a, a tent maker. Well, wait a minute. Didn't Paul, he made tents to support his ministry. And if you look at that, that comes from Acts 18. And yes, if you look at it and read it carefully, it says Paul was making tents with Priscilla and Aquila. And he every Sabbath was in the synagogue. But then Silas and Timothy come and join him. And it says he daily went out and preached the word. And so he was only able to minister on the weekends while he was making tents. Silas and Timothy came. And what happened? Now he's able to go full time because he had a support team. They were then working to enable him to go full time. And that's exactly what a support team is. Yeah, you can, you can keep a job. And sometimes God calls us to do that, to be bivocational. But sometimes he says, I want you to go full time and trust me with this. And I'm going to have other people that are going to be working to provide for that need. So, yes, it's very biblical. And I think it's very funny that Paul, he was not um, uh, shy at all about asking for help. In fact, uh, I want to show you a little scripture. here. It's in Romans uh, 15. And um, it says, can you see that up there? Romans 15. I am planning to go to Spain, and when I do, I'm going to stop off at Rome. So he's writing the Romans to say, I'm coming to see you, which in that culture meant uh, somebody's going to house me. He's not going to get a room at the Holiday Inn, 
and somebody's going to pay for my meals while you're there. He says, so I'm going to be there. And after I've enjoyed fellowship for a little while, you can provide for my journey. Isn't that great? It's like you calling up one of your friends, say, hey, I'm going to come see you. I'm going to stay a few weeks. Then after that, you can buy my plane ticket to the next location. Paul was not hesitant <laughs> about asking for support. He, uh, he was very, um, I think that's very upfront fun. about it. And so we see that. And another one, I love another one. First Corinthians 16, it says this. He says, I'm going to come and I'm going to stay with you a while. In fact, I might even stay all winter. Wow. <laughs> Imagine if you had a missionary call you up and say, hey, I'm going to come see you. I may just stay for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I may not even leave till February. I'm just going to stick around for a while. Thanks for housing me during that time. So Paul was not hesitant at all to, to expect people were going to be a part of his ministry. I'd love to have room to do that. And so um, let me just ask again, if you're um, – uh, just joined us. We're asking everybody to mute their microphones so that we don't have all kinds of interruptions. And then at the end, we will um, take questions. So thanks again for joining us, everybody. So it is biblical to have a support team. Um, you see, Jesus had one. Paul had one. You even see it in the Old Testament that there were those that were supported by the faithfulness of God's people. And so um, it's a biblical concept, Old Testament, New Testament. So if this is biblical, what do we do first to build a support team? And um, I want to just, uh, again, if you're following along in the notes, the first thing you, we want to ask you to do is just to pray. I'm not going to talk a lot about praying and trusting God and all that, because that's, that's a foundation. I hope you understand that, that this is a God thing. You can have the best presentation. You can have the best material. You can have an awesome website, a fantastic newsletter. You can have an amazing ministry that's changing the world. But if God's not touching the hearts of people, it's not going to work. You need God touching people's hearts to be coming on board with your support team. So the first thing we do is pray. Lord, direct me to the people that you have that are to be a part of this. You've got those out there that you want to be a part of this, that you want to bless through this, you, that you want to be a part of my support team. Lord, I need you to direct me. So the first thing we do is pray. Get our heart right. We're not looking to people. We're looking to the Lord. He is our source, but he does it through people, not through angels knocking on the door and leaving bags of gold. That'd be wonderful, but it's going to be through people. So get my heart right to where I'm not looking at people. Lord, I'm looking to you as my source and my provider. So the first thing we do is pray. But then secondly, as I mentioned to you, I got together a list of names for people to send a letter to. So the second thing you do is brainstorm, or some people call it name storming. Because you want to just think of every name you can think of. Jot down every name you can think of. Anybody. You don't have to worry about an address for them right now. Just put the name down. I mean, I, I put my dentist on the list. I, I had a, my sixth grade science teacher. For some reason, she came to mind. I put her on the list. And by the way, years later, not right away, but years later, she became one of our supporters up until the day she passed. Uh, my sixth grade science teacher. Hadn't seen her since sixth grade. But her name came to mind, and I jotted it on my list and later tracked down an address for her. So just put down anybody you can think of and never say no <laughs> for somebody else. This is crucial. Never say no for somebody else because it's easy to think, well, you know, I know that person. They're, they, they don't have a lot of money, or I know them. They're, in a finance, they're out of a job. Never say no for somebody else because the people – that you think are going to support you are probably not going to be the ones to support you. If you've been at this a while, you already know this, right? The people who support you, many times you look at it and go, how in the world are they able to do this? It's so humbling. It's so, it's so, um, it brings me to tears many times. Just, I can't believe that these people, I know how they're struggling financially. I know what kind of home they live in. And yet they give every month to be a part of our ministry. And so never say no for somebody else. Put down every name you can think of. And then later, you can begin to look for addresses for those. So you start doing that, but there's another thing you do at the same time. And here's the crucial thing. We need to clarify uh, what your ministry is. So the first thing you're doing is you're name storming, you're brainstorming, you're writing down every name you can think of. And by the way, at this point in time, your main ministry is collecting names God is going to orchestrate divine connections. You're going to bump into somebody at the grocery store. When you do, get their name and address and contact information. I used to carry three by five cards. Now, 
maybe you're techie enough that you could just pull your phone out and just enter it right there, you know. But I just find three by five cards still work pretty quickly because I can just give it to them and they can write it down real quickly or I can jot it down quickly. But get a name. Get a snail mail address. You go, well, I'm not going to use snail mail. Yeah, you'll want to use snail mail. If you can get a snail mail and an email address, get both. And if they'll even give you a cell phone number, get that because text messages are becoming the way to go. And so you want to get as much information as you can because with technology changing, as you know, emails now are old school, right? Very few people email. Well, everybody emails, but very I don't hardly check mine at all. If you've ever emailed me, you figure that one out, right? So, and so I hardly check my email. So technology is changing. So you want to stay current. You go to Facebook. Maybe text messages. So get as much information as you can from folks, as much as they're comfortable giving. And that's one of your main ministries right now is building that support team list, people that are potential. And I look at it this way. It's like if I have a pipe that's only this big, only that much water can come through it. Now, if I have a pipe this big, if I have 100 people on my mailing list and I've got a project going on, that's as much as can come to me. If I've got 500 people on my mailing list, I may still only have this many people that are giving, but I have a potential of this. And you'll find that some people, they may never give to support you individually. But if you start a project of caring for somebody in their home or doing this, people may start giving to a project. And so you may have somebody on your list that's never given to you in 10 years and all of a sudden something comes up and they give to you. So when do you take somebody off your mailing list? Never. <laughs> I mean, maybe if they're dead, maybe uh, you might think about it then if you're absolutely certain they're dead, but somebody's getting that letter. Somebody's getting that email. And so I just send to everybody because you never know. I believe that newsletter that you send out is like a tool that God can use to touch people's hearts. Yeah. And I've had that happen to me before. I got a newsletter. I get, as you might guess, I get a newsletter from lots of missionaries. And there's this one guy I'd met. And he was very arrogant. And I didn't like him. And his ministry was good, but I, the guy was just very arrogant. And uh, I got his newsletter in one time, and I just, oh, okay. And I threw it in the trash, and the Lord just pricked my heart. He says, I want you to give that guy $100. And I go, oh, man. I, you know, and I tried to ignore it, and I went through the rest of my life. And I just, finally, I had to dig that letter out of the trash, put a, hundred, you know, put a check for $100 in, and mail it to him. And I thought, now I'm never going to get off his mailing list. <laughs> but God used that letter to, to prompt me. He wouldn't have awakened me at 4 a.m. to say, I want you to send a check for $100 to this address in wherever, Texas. You know, God used that. And I believe God uses these letters and posts <laughs> many times to touch people's hearts that would never be touched otherwise, as, as my little uh, testimony there shares with you. So, that's what we're doing. Send it, send them out to everybody because you never like, know. They may pass it on to somebody else. I've had people too have told me, I got a donation from somebody. I didn't even know who they were. I <laughs> called them and found out who they were. And somebody, at the, the, uh, a friend of mine who's a donor, gave them my newsletter at church. Yeah, and they started supporting me because of that. So you never know where these printed letters are going to go. And that's why we still believe in printed letters. Even though email, I know it's cheap and it's free, but it's also very easy to hit delete. Printed letters still have value. So you want to get, right now, one of your biggest ministries is gathering names. I'm just getting out. Okay, let me ask one more time. If you're new with us, you just joined on here, would you look in the right left-hand corner of your screen there on your picture and just click the little microphone so that you're muted so that uh, we don't have interruptions. And then at the end, we're going to take all kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. We'll just spend as long as it takes to get your questions answered. So, so right now, your main ministry is building that support list and clarifying your ministry. And that's what I want to talk with you about next is what do we mean by clarifying the vision? Um, we're going to, in that, that first letter that we send out, we're going to tell people what we're going to be doing. However, many times we, we, um, we feel like we have to sell ourselves. We feel like we have to convince them that we're the most amazing missionary that ever walked the face of the earth, that we're worthy of support. And so we, we want to talk to them about what I'm doing. And I've just seen that so many um, missionary, um, so many missionary newsletters, and so many missionary reports kind of look like a selfie. It's it's about me. Um, I'm going to be doing this, and I'm going to be doing that, and this is what I'm going to be doing. And um, we don't we don't want it to be a selfie because this isn't about us, right? This is about the Lord. 
this thing that we're doing is something that began as a dream in God's heart. It began as a plan in his heart. And we want to keep the focus on him. How can we do that? And I believe uh, there's a couple of steps that can help us do that so that we have no more selfies. There's a couple of steps that if we will think these steps through, then they will help us to clarify what we're doing and be able to share it with them as a God perspective, as a God thing. And so the first thing is this, remembering this is God's idea and we want to keep the focus on him. The first thing is this, think about what is the darkness that your ministry is attacking? What is the human, the spiritual, what is the problem that what you're doing is attacking? What is the darkness? And then secondly, how is what you are doing making a difference in that area of darkness? Now, that may be a little, for some of us, that's a little hard to think through, but what is the darkness? And, and here's one way to, to kind of capture what that darkness is. What is it that grabbed your heart enough to cause you to change your lifestyle and to begin to do, to give your life to what it is that you're doing? What is it that grabbed your heart that, that caused you to be willing to change your life and go after this and do this full time? And then how is what you're doing making a difference? Now, in that how is what you're doing, that's where we have to drill down a little bit sometimes and think about not what you're doing, but a deeper question than that. What is it that you're doing that is making an eternal difference? What is it you're doing that's making an eternal difference? And let me give a couple of illustrations on that. For example, I heard from a, um, a missionary uh, kid teacher. He taught at a missionary school in Central America. And he sent a newsletter out and he said this. He said, you know, many times people ask me, well, what do you do as a missionary teacher on the field? He said, well, pretty much I teach kids just like I did in the States. Even I even use some of the same textbooks. I teach, teach English speaking missionary kids using the same books. I teach in English, teaching them American history or teaching them this. And that's what I do. And I wrote back to him and I said, you know, brother, that is what you do, but that's not what you do. That is not what captured your heart to raise your own support, leave your family and leave your country to move to another place. I said, let me just tell you what you do, because I know parents in your class. And I know for a fact, one of them is a Bible translator who has said, I would not be here translating the Bible if there wasn't a good school for my kids. So, brother, you're enabling Bible translation into this indigenous dialect. And I know there's a family in your uh, classroom that are planting a church there. They wouldn't be there if they didn't have a good school for their kids. You're enabling church planting in your country. I know there are people there that work with street kids who are blowing their brains by sniffing rubber cement every night. You're getting kids off the street by being there as a missionary kid teacher. And so what I'm talking about is drilling down, what do you do? Well, I work in an orphanage. Well, what do you do? Well, I change diapers and I clean up messes and I holler at kids and chase down five-year-olds. Yeah, that's what you do. But what is it you do? That's not what captivated your heart. You didn't leave your home and raise support to go change diapers. You left your home because you could see the vision that by tr discipling kids and raising them up in an orphanage, you're raising up a new generation of spiritual leaders in that country that can revolutionize that country. And so sometimes we have to drill down a bit to figure out what is the darkness, what it captivated our heart at the start, and what is the darkness, what is the problem that we are addressing by the ministry that we're doing? And I'll just give you real quickly, um, in my situation, it was kind of difficult. You know, when I was a missionary on the field and I was running feeding centers and doing pastor training and all those, it was real easy then. Wow, we're doing this and that. Um, this is how we're affecting this nation spiritually. But when all of a sudden I found myself basically an administrator sending missionaries, I had to figure out, well, what do I do? Well, I sit at a desk a lot. I talk to a computer screen. I answer the phones. I fill out forms. I work with the government. Yeah, that's what I do. But that's definitely not what excited me and caused me to get into this ministry. I had to drill down. I thought, what is the darkness? And so my presentation goes, basically, I realized the darkness is, we're in a day in our time when we need more and more missionaries on the field. Our world is growing darker and darker, and yet we're sending out fewer and fewer missionaries. Why is that? 
I think one of the reasons is we make it so hard for people to go. It's already hard. There's already a lot of obstacles you have to get over to get on the mission field. And yet we feel like we have to put up more obstacles. Well, you need this training and that training and this preparation and that preparation. I talked to a young lady one time. I'm about ready to go on the mission field. I applied five years ago to this mission and they're about ready to let me go. And I'm going, five years? What have you been doing for five years that you were so inept? And basically, she'd been doing office work in their office. Is that preparing you for the mission field? No, but they'll t- I'm about ready to go, they say. Really? You probably could have done office work in Central America or in Asia and been helping out somebody over there for five years, you know? So the point is, that was the darkness. But I had to drill down to figure out it's not what we do. It's what we do that is impacting making an eternal difference. That's what we're interested in. And so once we've drilled down and we have that, then we're ready to write our initial letter and announce to the world that we're what we're doing. Once we've got that clarified in our mind, we write a, a concise letter, one page, maybe two pages if you're using 14-point type. But if you have to go over two pages, you haven't clarified it enough. Because here's the other secret. People really aren't that interested in what you're doing, you need to be, you need to have a clear vision of it, but they believe in you. And so if you kind of tell them, I'm going to go down here, this is the problem, this is what captivated my heart, and this is what I'm going to do, they believe in you. And if if you say, well, this is something I want to do, Ryan, when you're talking about what you're doing there, they go, well, I don't know if that's really a need, but Ryan believes it is, and I believe in Ryan, so I'm willing to get behind him and support him. We just need to, as much as possible, present what captivated our heart, share that with them, but we don't have to go into great details. Statistics, you know, there's 5,000 of these or 10,000 of these or the 7 million billion people in the world. There's, that goes over people's heads. Share what captivated your heart, share it quickly, share it briefly, and then give them an opportunity to be a part of what you're doing. So that's the first thing. We've drilled down. We know what makes an eternal difference. We have now sent out our first letter letting the world know, our world anyway, everybody we could think of, we've let everybody know via email and via snail mail, hey, we are going on the mission field. Now we're ready to start building our support team. Well, I thought I was doing that with that first letter. No, the first letter is just kind of introduction. Um, But I want to share one other thing with you, and then we're going to look at how we can get traction in building our support team. I heard a Wycliffe missionary say this, lead with your passion, not with your need. In other words, my passion is this. That's what I'm saying. Here's what grabbed my heart. Not, I need this much money so that I can go. I have a need of this. I need this. I need. Because if you lead, lead with your passion, not with your need, otherwise people will think that your need is your passion. And your passion needs to be changing lives and making a difference for eternity. So now we're ready. We've, uh, we've created our list, everybody we can think of. We've not said no for anybody. We have clarified our passion. What's the darkness? What's the solution? How are we making a difference? And now we're ready to uh, begin to, we've sent out our newsletter so the world's aware of it. How do we start building our support team? And there are a lot of ways to do that. And I'm going to show you a little list here of a number of ways to communicate with donors and potential donors. And um, you'll see here about eight ways of sharing your vision. And uh, on the lower left, you'll see online, website, blog, Facebook. From the lower left, we work our way up to the upper right. On the lower left, we have ways that are um, lower effort. It's easy. Well, it may not be easy to put together a website, but effort I'm talking about as far as emotional effort, lower cost, lower Uh, social capital. It doesn't threaten your relationship with anybody to put out a blog or put out a, well, Facebook, it might if you get too political on it, right? (laughs) Especially today. But um, to to put out a blog or a Facebook post about you going on the mission field, that's, that doesn't cost any emotional capital. So it's a low effort, low cost, but guess what? It's also low results. You're not going to get much results. You're not going to get much results from a website, even no matter how cool it is, from a blog or from a Facebook post. We had a missionary come to us one time and he said, oh, you know, I don't need all this. I'm going to raise all my funds using Facebook. 
And we tried to encourage him. Mm, that's not really a very effective way. Oh, but you're, you're old folks. You know, I'm from a young generation. All my friends are on Facebook. And he didn't know how short the lifespan of a Facebook post is. And he thought every time he put out a post, all 2,000 of his friends were seeing it, and they were just going to respond overabundantly to his Facebook post. And after a short period of time, he wouldn't listen. And after a short period of time, he was off the field because he couldn't, couldn't get his support together. Facebook posts are just not that effective. As we move to the right and up, a little more effective is newsletters and prayer cards. Now, all these things are good. We need to be doing them, but they are kind of a way of keeping the wheel spinning. They're not a way of building a support team. They just kind of a way of keeping people informed. <clears throat> now, the next thing, large group and small group. From my denominational background, that's the way you raise support. You got into churches and you tried to get churches to support you. And I'm just telling you the most effective thing you can do when you get a chance to speak to a small group, a Sunday school class, or even a church, the most effective thing you can do is use that opportunity to gain names for your mailing list, your email and your snail mail list. Because people may hear you and you may have the most amazing presentation. They may go out of that church just stunned with your presentation but you know how that goes, right? After lunch, they don't remember your name and can't even remember what you talked about. That's the way you are at church, right? <clears throat> the pastor has an amazing sermon, amazing presentation. Boy, right after lunch and your nap, you don't even remember what it was about. He doesn't even remember what it was about. And so the, the most effective thing you can do in those large groups is build your, get names and addresses and snail mail. And of course, get permission to do this. Um, you know, some pastors get really upset if you're, drafting names, but give people an opportunity to sign up if they'll let you and get snail mail, email. And as I've said, mentioned before too, if they'll give it to you, even give their, get a cell phone number because text messages are the way that's coming about to stay in touch with people. Um, that's, that's just the, it's going to replace, I don't know that it'll ever replace printed newsletters, but it definitely will replace emails. And so get, get your names. Now, as we move further up, we're seeing more effective ways. We have personal email. And a personal email does not mean that you went to MailChimp and you entered one of those little merge tags and it says, Dear Bob, that's not a personal email. A personal email is when you sit down and you go, Dear Bob, hey, remember the time we were at the pool together and I was talking to you about I'm going to be going on the mission field? Well, hey, brother, it is happening and I want to talk to you about this and I want to share with you what's going on and share some of my financial goals. That's a personal email. Okay, so those are more effective uh, but they're still real easy to delete. And so we move on up a personal letter. That's, again, where you've sit, sat down and you've actually written a letter to them, handwriting, and sent them a personal letter. Those are more effective. But you see, those are still in gray. We're moving now to the things that are really the most effective as we get up this list. But they also are a high effort and a high cost. And again, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the social capital that you're going to spend when you call somebody on the phone and begin to talk with them about finances. And so these are high cost, but guess what? They have high results as well. And so when you're down in that lower corner there, it's like spinning your wheels in the sand. I, I grew up in the North and I, I was used to being stuck in snow drifts and not being able to get traction on ice. When I moved to the South and first time I went on a beach, I got stuck in the sand. And that was something different. And I was my, I was spinning my tires and sand was flying everywhere, but I wasn't going anywhere. And that's kind of what it's like when you're down in that lower left-hand corner. I've had people tell me, oh, I'm working hard at building my support. I'm just working so hard. I'm like every day I'm, I'm putting out a new blog. <clears throat> I put out three Facebook posts a day. I'm working hard. Yeah, but it's like stuck in the sand. You're working hard. You're throwing sand everywhere, but you're just not getting much traction. And we need to be doing things that are going to get us traction. And those are the things up in the upper right-hand corner. And you can work hard, work smarter, not work harder when you're working up in that upper right-hand corner. And those are like phone calls. If you can talk to somebody personally, that's better than a phone call. But you may have somebody cross-country or around the world that you can't um, connect with in a, in a person. So you can phone call them or you can text them to set up a phone call or set up a Zoom meeting, something of that nature, where you can talk to them uh, kind of personally, in quotes, or you can talk to them personally. So those are more effective. 
But the number one most effective, most traction, you're not going to be spinning your wheels, is a personal visit or a personal meeting. If you can actually sit down and talk to them face to face and share with them what's on your heart and communicate, transmit that passion that you have to them. Because if they can catch that passion, then they are going to be as excited about what you're doing as you are. Well, maybe not as excited, but they're going to get more excited about it if they can catch that passion and and see what it is that's driving you. And now you say, but, you know, I'm not sure I could do that. That's that's very hard because it's just hard to sit and ask people for money. We've got to get it out of our head that we're asking people for anything. You're not asking people for anything. You are inviting them to join you on an exciting adventure. That's really what you're just. I'm just throwing the invitation out here. I am doing something that is amazing. And you're a friend of mine. And I just want to invite you to join me in it. I think of it this way. If you were, um, if you want a trip to Disneyland and you could uh, bring along 15 friends and you, would you feel hesitant to go to them and say, Hey, um, I got this opportunity to go to Disneyland. And um, I just kind of wanted to know, well, you did you'd be glad to invite them, right? Because this is going to be fun. This is going to be great. You're going to love this thing. And so I'm going to invite you to go with me to Disneyland. This is better than Disneyland. What you're doing is better than Disneyland. You would pay people to let you do this if you could, right? This is so great. And so all you're doing is inviting them. If they take the invitation, great. If they don't take the invitation, God has other people that he wants to go along with you on this trip. All you have to do is find them. So we got to get it out of our head that, oh, we're hand, sticking our hand out and asking for something. We're not asking for anything. We're inviting people to join us in something that is so exciting that we're giving our life to it. And if, if it's that exciting, why would you not want your friends to be a part of it and to share in it with you? That's the mentality we have to keep in this. We're just simply inviting people to be a part of something that is really amazing and really awesome. In fact, let me tell you a story about how effective these personal meetings are. We had a missionary who came to one of our orientations, and uh, he had already built a lot of his support team. He had a bunch of people who were going to donate. But after we talked about these personal meetings, he decided he was going to go home and contact every one of them and sit down personally and meet with them. And he told me what happened. He said, I contacted him, and most of them said, well, now, Brian, we already told you we're going to support your ministry. He said, I know that, but I just want to sit down. I want to talk with you. I want you to know what I'm going to be doing. And so he said he was able to set meetings with every one of them. And he told me, he said, when every one of them, after I talked with them personally, these were people who had already pledged to give, every one of them increased their pledge. And he said most of them doubled what they were going to give before. And he said, Why why are you doing that? Why are you giving more? And I said, Well, because now we know you're not just needing money. You want people on your team with you. You want people to be a part of what you're doing. And so the people said, now we understand the vision. Yeah, we throw money at it because, yeah, we know you, Brian. We love you. We believe in you. Whatever you're doing, it's got to be okay. But now we know we're a part of a team. And so they grabbed that concept that we want you to be part of this team and sharing this with me. So make that personal contact. And one of the, it, it only makes sense, too, that a personal contact would be more effective. Because let me ask you this. When you proposed, or ladies, when you were proposed to, how excited would you have been, ladies, if your husband had said, hey, I've got this web blog, I've got this website out here that I created. I want you to go out and check it out. And you go check it out. And it's like got fireworks and stuff and pictures. And then it says, will you marry me? Not too cool, right? Um, he put a lot of work into that. But. You just don't propose that way. Or how about if he sent a nice letter and it was all romantic and it was just put on le- wonderful letterhead and you read it and at the bottom it says, will you marry me? That's just not the way you do that stuff. You do it in person. You think ahead, you plan ahead, you plan the place, and then you prepare what you're going to say, and then you lay it out there. And why do you do it that way? Because it says two things. It says, I've got something really important to talk with you about. And even more important than that, it says, you are important to me. And that's what the personal meeting does. And that's why it's so much more effective when we can do it in person. It says, you're important to me, and this is important. What I'm going to share with you is important. So we want to set those personal meetings. In fact, if you were to sum up 
support team building in one word. You could sum it up in this word right here, relationship. Because building a support team is all about relationship. As I mentioned before, many times people may not even know exactly what you're doing. They don't under quite understand about the need that you've bought into and, and are meeting, uh, even though you explain it to them. I mean, I, I'd been on the field for a number of years and I would come back and I'd run into people and I, I was in Central America and they'd ask me, how are things going in Mexico? Well, we're not really in Mexico. Oh, South America. No, it's not really South America either. What do you, what do you even do down there? And I knew they'd been getting all my newsletters, but it just doesn't connect. And so Many times, but they would many times they were supporters who didn't even know what we were doing, but they knew me and they they trusted me. They had seen our ministry, maybe we'd ministered to them. And so it's really all about building relationships. And so we find that support team building is a bi directional ministry. Yes, there are those people God's called you to minister to, maybe orphan children or drug addicts on the street or or um, people being rescued from. Uh, sex trafficking or human trafficking, or whatever. There's that direction of ministry, but you also have an opportunity to minister back to those people that are supporting you. And the more you realize that bi directional ministry, the more you minister back to them, the more they're going to be a part of what you're doing. Even though they may not understand that direction of ministry, they realize that you're effective in what you're doing because they're blessed by it. And so in my newsletters, my ministry reports, I always try and include a story or something that encourages them, that ministers to them, a little mini message that's not preachy, but it's a story with some sort of a moral. Boy, this is what I learned from this. This is how I understood this. And something that ministers to them and pours into their life because it's a bi-directional ministry, ministering to those God's called you to minister to, but also ministering to those that are part of your support team. And so when we can understand that, that we're, we're re- building relationships in bi-directional, caring for other people, those people that support us, we have an opportunity to minister to them. So people believe in you. We are now ready to, uh, we're ready to set up that meeting. How do we go about it? What do we do now? Well, we're going to give them a call. You're going to plan ahead what you're going to say before you call. You might even practice it. You might find somebody that'll listen to you, maybe maybe a spouse or a friend and say, hey, I'm, I want to practice my presentation because many times what's very clear to us isn't clear to other people. And so if you can share it with somebody ahead of time, say, does that make sense to you? What questions come to mind? Because I want to be answering questions that people are asking, not answering questions people aren't asking. And many times what's important to us isn't what's important to them. And so practice it with somebody, plan ahead what you're going to say, practice it with somebody, polish it up just like you would in that wedding proposal, and then choose a place that you can meet with them if there aren't going to be a lot of distractions. A person's business lunchroom is probably not going to work pretty, very well. With people coming in and going out, maybe their living room is not going to work very good if they have five kids that are going to be running in and out all the time. You want minimal distractions. So maybe a coffee shop or take them out to lunch or something like that. Um, Choose a place, and then you call to set the appointment. Now, I want to share with you some things. I've kind of come up with like a sample script that you can use. Um, and this is very um, dry, but it's it's the bones that you can kind of use to um, craft what you want to say to them. And, of course, make it very personal. You want to start off with, you know, just chatting with them because you're calling them on the phone. How you doing? How's the family? How things going on? Hey, I've got something I want to talk to you about. You probably received my letter, and you know that uh, I'm going to be going to Rwanda to work with pastors over there, or whatever. Just briefly describe. Could I, I'd love to sit down with you. Could I sit down with you and share some details about our ministry, vision, and our financial goals? Uh, maybe next Thursday or Friday, mid-afternoon, morning. What would work for you? Like maybe we'd go to Starbucks and get some bad coffee, and uh, I'll take you out for a cup of really, really bad coffee at Starbucks that's overpriced. And we can just, I want to share with you. So what you've done here is you've, you've not shared too much because if you say, yeah, I want to talk with you. I'm I'm going to really see if you could support our ministry for $50 a month and see if you could be a partner with us. Then they're going to be already answering the question ahead of time. Well, you know, it's really kind of a rough time. I, I I don't know if I financially can. And you've, you don't get the chance to share your vision with them, but you also don't want to share too little. 
well, I was just kind of thinking, we haven't touched base in a while, kind of thinking it might be fun to sit down and have coffee. And then they come and they feel broadsided when you start talking about money. You know, you've probably had that situation where you're invited over to somebody's house for tea and all of a sudden you come in and there's this full presentation, you know, selling you something. You go, oh my gosh, I didn't know this. And so you don't want them to be, feel broadsided. And so you share, I want to share with you some details about our ministry and what we're going to be doing over there, but also talk to you about some financial goals. So they know what that means. And they don't feel broadsided when you sit down. And so you you set up a time, and then here's a key also. You've got that time set up. And so now this is really an important time to you, and you're not going to forget it. But guess what? This is not number one on their agenda of life. So you need to make sure you call to confirm that meeting, the time, and the place. Uh, you maybe have had meetings where you showed up on time, and they showed up at time. But it was at the different Starbucks, the one on the other side of town instead of this one. And so you want to confirm the time, confirm the place, and then you show up. Now, we've got the meeting set. They're coming. <gasps> what do we do now? What are we going to say at that meeting? Well, we've already worked a lot to clarify our vision. But we're going to go through that a little bit more. The same process when we're planning what we're going to share, how we're going to share our vision. First of all, again. What is the darkness? Remember, we have, um, we're not going to be, uh, no more selfies, right? No more selfies. So we're going to clarify what is the darkness? What is the problem that we're addressing? What is the situation that we are going to um, meet when we go on this need? What is the human problem? What's the thing that captivated our hearts? And that's where we need to share emotionally. As much as we all want to think we are rational creatures, all the research shows that we make our decisions emotionally. There is an emotion that is touched even before our rationale kicks in. And that, all the research proves that. And so we want to share not just the stats and the facts and figures, because those just, at least for me, they go right over my head. I'm not impressed with facts and figures and numbers. But you grab me emotionally and share, here's what's going on. Here's the need. Because that's what caught your heart. It wasn't the facts and figures that you read. It was that you saw a person or you saw a need. And this grabbed your heart. And that's what you need to share is emotionally. At this point in time, when you're putting this part of the presentation together, sharing what the darkness is, it is crucial that you have a contagious passion about you. You are passionate about this. But what can happen is oftentimes that initial passion by our own natures tends to calm down and you have to sort of stir it up that it's in there. You're not faking anything. It is in there. You're passionate enough about this that you're changing your life to do this. So it's in there. But sometimes you have to stir it up and remind yourself of what initially caught you and got you excited about this. And so because if you come across, yeah. We, we're kind of hoping someday to get over to Rwanda. You know, there are pastors over there that really could use some help. Well, if you're no more excited about that, why would I be excited about that? And so we share, it's not faking it. It is stirring up what is actually in there that's driving you and sharing that passion, a contagious passion that you're going to share with them about what you're doing. And so we, we, uh, we've now described the darkness. We've got that in our presentation. Here's the need, and here's why it's so desperate that I'm willing to change my life, and I'm willing to sit down and ask you to invest financially in it. Isn't that crazy? But that's how big this need is. And then, again, we're not thinking about, we begin to share how we're going to meet that need, but we're not talking about what we do. Well, I'm going to be over there, and I'm going to be a change in diapers. And no, no, no. What are you doing that will make an eternal difference? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to be working with these kids in this orphanage on a daily basis. We're not only going to train them in their local language, we're going to teach them English, which will give them a tremendous head start in their country and allow them to become a leader in their country. And we are training, we are praying and believing that these kids are going to go on to be leaders in their nation. We're going to help them get an education that will put them above the average person in their nation. And so we're training up a generation of Christian leaders. I'm not just changing diapers. I'm not just changing, chasing rambunctious kids. I'm training up a generation of leaders. 
And so we, we share with them, what is it you're doing that makes an eternal difference? And then I share with them. Now, here's something that's very critical. We share with them why it's important that you have a support team. Because some people think, well, why don't you just go over there and get a job? You have a skill. Why don't you just go over there and work? And, you know, like with me in my situation, I share with them, you know, we're sending missionaries on the field. And it would be very easy for me to just say, well, hey, we're going to charge a 10% administrative fee and 1% of that's going to go for my salary. We could do that. Some mission agencies do that. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be in the same status that the missionaries are in. I wanted to be raising my support just like they're raising their support. That's why I need you to help me so that I can help them. And by supporting me, you're helping every one of these missionaries because now their funds can go to them instead of going to pay my salary. And so by you helping me to feed my family and care for my needs and do my ministry, you're helping all these missionaries out there. Your, your gift is multiplied so much over. And so you need to share why it's important that you have a support team. Yeah, I could go there and get a job, but like Paul, I'd be spending my whole week making tents and could only go and minister on the weekends. And this is such an important need. I need to be there every day. I need to be given full time to this. And I can only do that if you will help me so that I can help others. And so we share why it's important because some people don't catch it. I remember when I was pastoring a church and we were a very missions oriented church, but I had a guy come up to me who'd been in church all of his life. He was in his seventies at that point in time. And he'd been in church all his life. And I announced that I was going on the mission field and he came up to me and it blew me away. He asked this question because he'd been in church all his life, missionary churches. And he said, now let me get this straight. You're going to go work with this mission agency and they don't pay you anything to do the work. I go, well, yeah. He said, in fact, you have to pay them an administrative fee so that you can work for them. Well, yeah, I, I know that that does sound just a little bit crazy, but yes, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go work for them and pay them so that I can work for them. So would you help me do that? And But this was a guy who just, he'd been in church all his life, but he just didn't get it. And so don't skip that step of here's why I need people to be a partner with me. And then, then we do the invitation. Now is when we say, hey, you want to be a part of this exciting ride with me? Again, we're not asking them for money. We're giving them an invitation. And some people say, well, at this point in time, you might suggest an amount they give. I'm not comfortable with that at all. Um, I prefer to use what's called a, um, a, giving, a, a level of giving or a log chart. And uh, so let me show you how that works here real quickly. This is a, a level of giving chart, and I just kind of put together some numbers here that would total up to $4,625. That was a random number. I just added, I, I put some things out there. Here's the reason I like this chart. I like to show my friends this chart and then say, can you see yourself somewhere in here? And here's the reason why. I don't. When I was pastoring again, I would have kids come up to me after church all the time and maybe you've had this happen. Uh, hey, pastor, pastor, our school is having a fundraising and we're going to walk around the track uh, times. And, and would you sponsor me an amount for every time I go around the track? And uh, I would look at that little chart to where you sign up and, and I would think, OK, um, I want to know what everybody else is giving. Because if, if everybody else is given 25 cents for every time they walk around that track, I don't want to give a dollar. But if everybody else is given a dollar, I don't want to give 25 cents. I want to know what's expected of me. Now, maybe you all don't have that problem, but I do. I want to know, hey, what's, what's expected here? I might be able to give you 50 bucks, but are you going to just snicker at that and go, well, that's nothing? Um, or are you going to say, wow, that's amazing? I kind of like to know what's expected. And so this level of giving chart lets people know. I would even on here actually put even $25 because for some people, $25 is a big, uh, a big sacrifice. And so um, I, you, with this level of giving chart, people can kind of see, oh, OK, so maybe somebody can give $400. But if I give $50 or like I said, I didn't even put 20 or 25 on there, a few people doing that because then they can know, OK, look, I'm I'm a single parent. 
but I spend 20 bucks on coffee a month or my cable bill, you know, whatever that is, you know, how much you spend on that. I could probably give 20 bucks. And so this level of giving chart, I think it just helps people to see that, okay, I can't give a hundred because I might even be able to give a hundred dollars a month, but I think a hundred dollars a month, that's not going to be very much. To, but if, 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 if you've already raised your support, you know, a hundred dollars a month is a huge help, isn't it? But a person who's looking and saying, gosh, this person needs that much money. I don't think a hundred is going to help. And now also that total down there, I would not include that on my giving chart. I don't like to talk about total budgets to people unless they specifically ask. And the reason is when you start talking about a total budget, some people are going to think, what? It caught, that's more than I make a month. And other people are going to go, well, that's not very much money. How are you going to do anything on that much money? So I don't like to talk about total amounts because people are going to swing one way or another. And they, because they can't understand what you're going to be living in Honduras and you need $4,000 a month. Well, actually, yeah, you probably need more than that because they don't understand. Hey, there's air flights, there's visa expenses, there's legal expenses, getting my paperwork done. There's, well, we don't pay bribes, do we? Um, there's all these other expenses that they just can't imagine having to pay. And they think the cost of living is real cheap down there. And they don't realize you're going to pay probably twice as much in some countries for a refrigerator, even a tiny one. And so I don't like to talk about the big budget. I just like to let them see, hey, here's areas where you can, here's a chart that you can kind of pop in and they can then begin to see, oh, okay, so if I give that much, that will help you out. And so here, now, what do we say? We, we've got our level of giving chart there that we can share with them. And how do we now begin to make the invitation? And again, to kind of help you out here, I've got some just sort of a sample invitation to partnership and you can adjust it. It's, these are all in your notes, by the way, those little sample conversations are in your notes and you can download those notes uh, afterwards. I made a real simple one. Uh, if you can see it, maybe over my shoulder here uh, on in the uh, thing, it's a bit.ly uh, website. It's B I T dot L Y. And let me turn around and read it. Capital C, capital M, capital N, C M N, and then lowercase web zero one. Capital C, capital M, capital N, lowercase W E B zero one. And so if you go to B I T dot L Y forward slash capital C, capital M, capital N, lowercase W, lowercase E, lowercase B zero one. C M N Web one. This is the a webinar one on raising uh, your support team and you can find these notes and they've got all this information in there with these little sample conversations. So it's time to invite the person to actually be on our support team. And here's just again, a simple, would you pray about partnering with us in this adventure? Now here's my, here's a log chart. I've put this out there for them, level of giving chart. As you can see, you know, to reach our budget, we need about 50 people. You might need 40 people. You might need 60 people. We need about 50 people to partner with us at these levels. And, you know, we know that God's already got the people out there. And we're just praying that you're going to be one of them that will be a part of it with us. And if you'd like to be a part of this ministry with us, we just want you to pray about it. Talk it over with one another. If you've got a couple there, talk it over with one another. And you know what? I'm going to give you a call tomorrow. No pressure now. I'm going to give you a call tomorrow. And uh, just see what the Lord has said. And in fact, I would even go on and do this with, you know, we want this to be a faith adventure for you. God is really stretching our faith in this, and we want it to be a, a faith stretching adventure for you too. So I'm going to just challenge you to not just kind of look at your budget and see what you can do. I'm going to really ask you to just pray about it and ask the Lord what he wants you to give. He may say nothing. And if he says nothing, that that's what I want you to give. I don't want you to be a part of this if the Lord says no, but he may uh, say an amount that might surprise you. And if, if that's what you hear the Lord say, then I, want, I just wanted to stretch your faith. It's an adventure that we're a part of, and you can be a part of it with us. Just a faith-stretching adventure. And here's what I would even suggest, because this is what my wife and I do. Jan and I, when we're praying about giving some, I'll usually go and ask the Lord, and she'll go and ask the Lord. And then the first number that comes into mind is what we feel like the Lord says, because if I begin to think about it and go, whoa, Lord, that's kind of a surprising number. Oh, whoa, Lord, I, we could give more than that. That's kind of an embarrassing amount to give. You know, I, I, we can give more than that. We usually respond with the first number that God drops into our heart. 
And then we'll come back together. Well, hon, what did you hear? Well, I heard this. Well, I heard this. And usually a lot of times it's the exact same amount. Sometimes it's pretty close and we'll then, well, we usually give the higher amounts what we usually do, but um, that's just us. But I would share that with them. This is what we do. And I would just encourage you guys to do that too. And you, you, God wants to confirm himself through this thing. And so again, this is a God deal. This is not just us trying to come up with a slick presentation. This is a God deal. We're wanting the Lord to show himself strong to them and convince them that he is in this and wants them to be a part of it. And so that's, we've, we've now shared that. And now what do you do? I, does this all make sense to you? Do you have any questions? And then wait. And that's the hard part. Wait. Because people need time to think. Hmm. Questions. Um, and just wait a minute. Do you have any questions? And we wait a minute and give them a chance to think it through. And if it's a husband and a wife or, or, or two people, you might say, do you have any questions? How about you? Make sure you've invited both of them to ask any questions. And then um, you just wait. And if there's no more questions, great. Let me just pray with you real quickly here. And God, I just pray that you'll just give them direction. Lord, I would love to have them part of our support team. If, if they're ones that you want to be a part of this and, and give them direction, Lord. And I'm going to give you a call tomorrow now. And then you just you finish up. What now? What next? Well, the next thing is you actually call them tomorrow. Don't expect them to call you. Remember, this is not number one on their agenda, but it better be number one on your agenda. It's important that you follow up. Give them a call tomorrow. And the reason I say tomorrow is they don't need a lot of time to pray about this. Frankly, if you're in a coffee shop, by the time a husband and wife or by the time they walk to their car and get in their car and drive off the parking lot, they've probably already decided what they can do. They're probably already hearing from the Lord because they're thinking about this while they're sitting there with you. And so it doesn't, they don't need hours and hours of prayer. They don't need to fast for a week and they're not going to fast for a week. So just call them the next day. And then if they say, well, we really don't know yet. Well, okay, I'll, what, I'll call you in a couple of days then. But don't don't give it weeks and weeks and weeks because they don't need that much time. They're going to they're going to hear from the Lord pretty quickly and, and you need to follow up. So you follow up, you call them the next day, no matter what the response, be grateful. They gave you some time. They listened to you. Well, you know, if they say, well, we just really felt like the Lord said no, or we just really can't do anything at this time. Matt, thank you so much. Well, I just appreciate your time. I'm going to keep you posted anyway, because, you know, God may put you on my heart to pray for me. And I just want you to, to just be praying for us. And by the way, when you're at that meeting, don't be asking, well, would you consider praying for us and supporting us um, or supporting us? Yeah, we'll pray for you. You're wanting them to be a financial supporter. So don't confuse the issue. One question, pray about being a financial supporter. And then later, because here's the deal. Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be. And I know missionaries like to go out and say, oh, would you pray for me? If you can't give, would you at least pray? And people go, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. How effective and how passionate is their prayer if they've not invested in you? Where your treasure is, is where your heart will be. So I would tell people, look, if you're either only going to pray or give, give. Because if you're giving, guess where your heart's going to be? And if you're, if they're giving to an, I'll tell you a story. Her missionary, he was from India. And after his passionate presentation, somebody came up to me and says, oh, you have such a heart for India. I wish I had such a heart for India like you do. How can, and the pastor said, or the missionary said, I can tell you how to have a heart for India. Really? How? Sit down right now and write me out a check for $5,000 and you'll have a heart for India. And that's true. If you wrote a check for $5,000 and you heard on the news, if you just walking through the room and you hear on the news that something's going on in India, boom, you're, what, 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 what's, what's happening in India? I got investment there. I want to know what's going on over there because it's important to you where your treasures, your heart will be. And so ask people to invest financially first, and then you can be pretty sure they'll be praying for you with more passion. So Ask, you can ask them at this time, well, thanks for your gift. Please be praying for us as well. I'm still going to keep you informed. I still want you to be a part of our prayer team, and we'll be sending our newsletters. And, of course, if they do say they want to give, help them through that first step. Um, I can, I can, you go to this website and with CMN at CMN forward slash your name and give them your website address. I'll email that to you with a link. So all you have to do is click on it. You can walk through the process. 
If you get stuck on it, give Marsha a call at this phone number, and Marsha will just be more than happy to help you walk you through it. And we've got help there for you. And so make sure you get them through that process. You don't want them to get snagged somewhere. Help them to make that uh, connection. Give them that website. Email them a link to where they all they have to do is click on it and follow through that process. And give them Marsha's phone number in case they have a problem so that they can they can get through there. And here's the deal. Don't be discouraged either way. If people are just, if, if everybody signs up or if nobody signs up, God has the people. This is his ministry. It's his dream to see this need met. He is just inviting you to be along with him in doing this. And so if it's his project, as Paul said, no soldier goes to war at his own expense. When I signed up in the Navy, they took all of my clothes and gave me these horrid looking dungarees and a hat to wear that was a goofy looking thing too. They paid for all that. They even fed me and housed me. And so a, a warrior doesn't go to war at his own expense. And so God is going to provide for this. It's just our job to find the people that he wants to be a part of our team. And it's like sowing seeds. Some of it's going to fall on good ground. Some of it's going to fall on hard ground. But because some of it falls on the sidewalk, you don't stop sowing. You keep sowing because God has the people out there and he's going to divinely connect you to them. So don't get discouraged uh, if you get a lot of no's. Um, but I don't believe you actually will. If you're talking to people and sharing your passion, you're not going to get a lot of no's. People are going to share that and catch that same passion that has touched your heart. Now, here's some other resources. There are several books, but I put the God Ask, and you'll see it's over my shoulder here as well. Um, I put that on the uh, screen. It's this shoulder over here uh, because it's probably the best book. It's real in your face, but it's very practical. It talks to you how to do these things that I've talked to you about. But here are some other online resources. Support Raising Solutions, an amazing ministry. Their whole ministry is helping people raise their support to be 100% funded. They've got tools and things. ScottMorton.net. Scott was the vice president, helped all the navigators. If you're familiar with the navigators, he helped all of them raise their support. He now does this full time, too. And he's got short video clips on there, how to do this, how to do your presentation, how to make phone calls, how to write newsletters. Amazing resources, all free out there. Kingdom Come Training is actually will uh, you pay for this, it, you, but you sign up for their program and then they assign you a coach that will actually walk through and hold you accountable. Um, we have good reports on that. And then the intensive course, the Support Raising Solutions, also has what they call a boot camp. People who've gone to that, I've they know what they're doing. I've talked to people who've gone to that, and every one of them, really, they're getting their support together. They're very effective. They walk you through it and actually help you to do it, too. So those are some great resources that are out there to help you. Again, those are listed in the notes, so you can find all of those there. And thank you again for just uh, being here with us.